Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show, and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. From Radio Beacon to Radio Beacon. Turn up your mind. If you would have to debate the current president, how does that conversation go without becoming reactive? How do you stay on your message mm-hmm. and not get caught up in his crazy? <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Um, Well, first, it's very important that anyone who who presents themselves as a leader and wants to be a leader will speak like a leader. And that means speaking with integrity. It means speaking truth. It means speaking... Speaking in a way that it expresses and, and indicates some level of interest and concern in people other than oneself. And, and so right there, we will see a great contrast. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it is about also having some concern for the future of our country. You know, it, it really, we are at an inflection point. We are the, the, in the world and in our country. And, and the people of our country, the families of our country, deserve to have leaders who are focused on their needs, their immediate needs, their long-term needs, the hopes and aspirations they have for their children and grandchildren, and speak to that as opposed to speak to the lowest common denominators and base instincts and speak in a way that is about inciting fear as a distraction from the fact you're getting nothing done except helping the richest people and the biggest corporations. Amen, sister, amen. Go tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on. Oh, she killed it last night. Kamala killed it. She killed it, killed it, killed it. That was amazing. It was worth staying up and sitting up, uh, you know, past the 10 o'clock mark. It was really, really worth it, I have to say. I will play some clips from uh, Kamala. I'm still getting used to saying her name correctly. Because I haven't given it the effort it uh, deserved for a very long time. But, uh, you know, Kamala killed it last night. Uh, Howard Schultz got killed last night. Uh, Trump has more articles in the newspaper today about how fraudulent he is, including including the fact that the United States of America is no longer in the top 20 uh, democracies with clean, non-corrupted government. I, I swear that's true. The entire system of democracy in the United States is literally being torn apart, torn limb from limb by the liar in chief and uh, his henchman, you know, all of them, Uh, his little, uh, you know, group of uh, merry bandits who are very keen to, uh, you know, take whatever tranches of money are left and put it in their pocket. It is just so unbelievable. And now, did you see Matt Whitaker yesterday? Because we were broadcasting when he Uh, You know, the Justice Department, uh, Christopher Wray, the FBI, uh, they indicted Huawei, you know, the Chinese company that puts out cell phones that spy on everybody. And so they indicted him. And Matt Whitaker, for some, you know, ridiculous reason, is our acting attorney general. And he's a very bad actor, I must say. And he gave uh, a little, uh, you know, uh, presser. He gave a little open press thing. And, of course, the press wanted to know about the Mueller investigation since Roger Stone had uh, been arrested, by the way, today, Mr. V for victory. Mr. V for I really do uh, have a vagina. Uh, And you're going to find out. You're going to find out that, uh, you know, Trump isn't going to be able to, uh, you know, mm -hmm, me. Uh, Roger Stone is looking for the best deal, obviously. He's, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about, uh, oh, his raid was like the bin Laden raid. His raid was like the El Chapo. Can I just say, I don't recall bin Laden giving a press conference, giving the V for victory or vagina sign uh, that Roger Stone was able to give just hours after his arraignment. I don't know. I think Osama bin Laden was dumped in the Arabian Sea never to be heard or seen from again. 
I think that was his demise. El Chapo, he says. It was just like El Chapo. El Chapo went down in, I mean, uh, he's still on trial in New York. Five people ended up dead in his raid. He escaped through one of his very sophisticated tunnels that a wall, a stupid, stupid wall, will not prevent, have any impact on, deter. You know, it's just like, uh, but that's how El Chapo got away. Five people were killed in that day. And Roger Stone, on the other hand, they went, FBI, open up, warrant. Same? Is that the same? I just uh, don't see it being the same. The reason why they did this, the reason why they had people in the front of the house and the back of the house, because he's a lion sack of crap. He's slimy. He's dirty. He makes everybody uh, want, you know, he likes having people believe that about him. He says it himself that he's the devil incarnate and he lives to be known this way and this is his identity. And they were afraid that either he would flee or that He would destroy evidence, so they made sure that nothing came out of the house. That's why they did it early in the morning when he was asleep. I mean, uh, it's not the same. But anyway, so you have this, and then Whitaker says that, oh, that's the end of the investigation. It ends with Roger Stone. There is no way. I read you that indictment. We read it. We read it out loud. We read all 23 pages. We unmasked uh, the identities of the Company number one, person one, person two. Uh, the only there's one person that we can identify in the indictment that because there's two things: high-ranking Trump administration officials, plural. So we know one is Steve Bannon. We don't know who the other one is. And then uh, a Trump um, administration official or a Trump campaign official directed which is the word BuzzFeed got hammered on, right? Uh, Directed Roger Stone to reach out to WikiLeaks and find out what else they had. And we don't know who that person is. Otherwise, we read that and died. This thing is, that is not over. That, That has so many more people in it that we don't know about yet that are yet to be indicted or yet to be cleared. This is just ridiculous. Ridic. And uh, did you see, I don't know if you saw Whitaker yesterday, but I wanted to play this for you again before, you know, in case you did see it, because I wanted to point out something to you. Look how this man had a rigorous case of flop sweat. Oh, my God. Did you see him just sweat? We're having a polar vortex. And he is sweating profusely. I mean, oh, you poor guys in the Midwest. You know where Jessica is? <gasps> Jessica? You know she works for MTV. Uh, she's, uh, you know, um, she just got promoted. She's supervising producer on uh, Team Mom. And she works on two shows, Team Mom, OG, and SG. Anyway, uh, she is assigned today to do an outdoor shoot of uh, one of the Teen Moms who decided to move today. They're moving. This is, you know, I'm not supposed to, you know, don't tell anybody. And it's outdoors and it's minus 17 degrees where she is in the Midwest. Minus 60 wind chills. So, of course, it's time for the idiot anti-global warming trolls to say that they don't understand climate change. Let me explain this to you in a sentence, if I can. The polar vortex used to stay up at the Arctic Circle, and now the jet stream uh, has been guided further south by climate change in the upper atmosphere. And now the Arctic, the North Pole weather, is able to sink further and further south. Now, could somebody just tweet something like that to Donald Trump, who tweeted this morning, what the hell is going on with global warming? Please come back fast. We need you. Normally, I would say no one is this stupid, but Trump really works at it. I mean, he gives it everything he's got to go to. And and Roger Stone, too. I mean, they are playing you like you're just a dumb little rock. And Whitaker... I don't know what his motivation was to talk about an ongoing investigation yesterday that, you know, uh, Mueller doesn't leak. You should you could see Chris Ray's little eyebrow go up in the background. But, you know, he decided to tell you uh, that he thinks that the Mueller investigation is almost over. It was the weirdest thing. And then, uh, you know, I watched it on my big HD TV. And I saw all of the little droplets of sweat 
on his forehead and his brow, and it was like, wow, he was freaky. Before you came into your current that. role, uh, you were publicly very critical of the special counsel mm -hmm. investigation. Now, since you have received your briefings, is there anything that you've seen or read that gives you concern about special counsel Robert Mueller or his investigation? You know, I've been fully briefed on the investigation, and, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, Director Mueller um, delivering the final report. And I uh, really am not going to talk about uh, open and ongoing investigation otherwise. But, you know, sort of the statements that I made were as a private citizen, only with publicly available information. Um, and, I, you know, I am, I am comfortable that um, the decisions that were made are going to be um, reviewed, uh, uh, you know, either th through the various means we have. But right now, you know, the investigation is, uh, I think, uh, close to being completed. And I hope that we can get the report from Director Mueller as soon as we as possible. If you if you showed up at TSA with flop sweat like that, they would call a SWAT team. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, look at him. He looks so nervous and so I, he looked like he was auditioning to play Matt Whitaker on Saturday Night Live. He didn't. I mean, it was just like, wow, this was really, really flop sweat. This was really, really unbelievable. Now, I don't know if he's lying or if he's merely deluded or if he's of the Trump mind set, which is if I say it often enough, it will come true. I don't, I don't really know, but I thought that was just so bizarre, so strange because of the amount of uh, terror that I saw in this acting attorney general, who will not be our attorney general for, you know, ever. I mean, he was the chief of staff to Jeff Sessions. That's who he was. And so pig in a poke, he became our acting after, uh, you know, Trump fire Sessions with absolutely no replacement. No replacement in mind. Had absolutely no idea. All this time he's threatening Sessions' job. Years. It's been a year and a half. Threatening, threatening, threatening. Didn't have, you know, what a manager he is. Oh, the skills. Wow. No, he plays a businessman on TV, just like Matt Whitaker there yesterday was trying to play an acting, uh, you know, he's a terrible actor, attorney general, terrible attorney general, on TV. Just so weird. But anyway, so he didn't have a replacement, he fires him, so we had to go with the chief of staff to the last attorney general of the United States, who is a Trump loyalist or proclaims to be. I, it was just, it was so bizarre and so weird. And in reading the indictment of Roger Stone, who, by the way, pled not guilty today, shocking, because he wants a pardon. And then if a pardon doesn't come, this man will flip and spread. He will open like a flower, just like a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. He will just be woo in full bloom and ready to be picked. Sorry, I'm a gardener. But I mean, this is crazy. Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. RandyRoads.com. Happy New Year, Herky Jerky fans. We certainly hope you had a festive holiday season and wish you a very prosperous 2019. It was so nice to hear all the positive feedback from customers who purchased Turkey Jerky products during December, either as gifts or for yourself. The feedback from the holiday special of the $10 off orders over $50 and free shipping was so well received that my favorite jerky makers decided to continue it into January. So let's keep it rolling. For the rest of the month, all qualifying orders get the same discount and free shipping, no promo code necessary. All natural turkey jerky continues to be the top seller, but the four flavors of nitrite and preservative free beef jerky, close second. Many of the longest running Herky Jerky customers still prefer the meat sticks like me, and why not? The venison, elk, and buffalo sticks and the beef smokies are the best on the market. And the bacon jerky, oh yeah, it's still delicious. So keep taking advantage of the savings and Herky Jerky will continue producing the jerky you love. And thanks again for supporting our sponsor, Herky Jerky. Just visit HerkyJerky.com. If you want to continue enjoying great shows like Randy Rhodes, Stephanie Miller, Tom Hartman, Leslie Marshall, and so many others on the free mobile Progressive Voices platform, please go to ProgressiveVoices.com and press the donate button right now. Thank you. Progressive Voices needs your help. 
Progressive Voices has grown in terms of audience, and that has also significantly increased their bandwidth costs. And they've tried to protect the limited commercial nature of their stream. And to keep up with costs, they need your help. You could say they're sort of victims of their own success with nearly a million regular listeners now. The cost of operating the stream has grown beyond their wildest expectations. So if you want to continue enjoying the David Pakman show on the free mobile Progressive Voices platform, please pitch in now. Go to progressivevoices.com and press the donate button. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. And here's a clip from Tara Buster with Tara Devlin. During the shutdown, I kept hearing uh, representatives, whenever they get on TV, of course, they have to throw out the obligatory, we are the greatest country on earth. Really? Um, If we were the greatest country on earth, why is it that 70-something percent of people can't miss one paycheck without it all crumbling down? But you see, that's how they like it. Not they, not the people, the oligarchs. They want you nice and compliant. They don't want you having the freedom to tell them no, to, you know, say, hey, I'm not doing that. I'm not working in these unsafe conditions. I'm not working these inhumane hours. I'm not working until I drop at 70-something years old. I want a retirement. I want to have a decent middle-class life. They don't want you having that that freedom. They don't want you being that uppity, for Christ's sakes. That's why they have systematically hobbled the working class of this country. It's not an accident. Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Yeah, that. Yeah, I have a couple of big problems with what Matthew Whitaker uh, announced yesterday. The first one, it's a, it's a complete amateur move. It is something that, as Laura said, is absolutely not done for good reason. It is a strategic fumble. It is, it is a tactical giveaway to announce we're almost done investigating. It's like being in the middle of a poker hand and announcing, I'm almost done betting, guys, right? You're going to incentivize targets and witnesses to drag their feet, to try to wait you out. Look at the Rudy Giuliani, Robert Mueller negotiation that's been going on over a sit-down interview. Now Rudy's gonna see this and think, okay, if they're almost done, if they're under time pressure, they're not gonna subpoena my guy, because that's gonna take months in the courts. So I'm just gonna tell them no dice. We're not talking to you, and there's nothing you can do. Also, Allison, as you said, it creates false expectations, this notion of close to being completed. I can't tell you how many times I've been privately, confidentially, close to what I thought was the end of an investigation. I'd never say it out loud. And then something new pops up. You get a new witness. You get a new cooperator. You find new evidence, maybe like in the search that was done the other day of Stone's homes. And the investigation can take on a whole new life, go in a whole different direction. And so it creates a real problematic expectation. Yeah, I mean, every every legal analyst, uh, you know, probed it last night. They all probed. And they all said the same thing. What the hell was he talking about? Why would he be saying this if... Mueller is still negotiating with us for a sit down with uh, Donald Trump. What is he saying? Uh, it's almost over. And so Trump just hold the line. Don't ever sit down with Mueller. I mean, what is that? And also, obviously, more indictments are coming because we read the indictment of Roger Stone. There are people that are unnamed in the indictment that have yet to be charged, obviously. And uh, we know that uh, there's been uh, some um, some. Mm, let's say doubt cast by Congress members who have heard testimony from guys like, oh, I don't know, Donald Trump Jr. There has been some doubt cast upon the veracity. And for those of you who, um, you know, are still in cult 45, the honesty of Eric Prince with his back channel Seychelles meeting with Russians. There, you know, you, there, there's so many people that are yet to be dealt with in this investigation. I mean, this is just so bizarre. It was just so strange. It was It was just, uh, uh, I mean, the, you have uh, the assistant to, um, here's a little small fry, who's not really that small of a fry, but 
Here's this guy, Andrew Miller, that my guys know. Why? My guys know him because they booked, before they came to work with me, uh, they booked other radio shows who will go unnamed because they thought it was big fun to talk to that lion, Ra- Roger Stone. They thought it was uh, just uh, a scream. And I was like, you know, dude, you don't give guys like this oxygen, okay? Because one of their tactics is to keep on putting the false narrative out in the public. Just say, repeat, repeat, repeat. It is the key um, advertising rule, right? Uh, re- repetition is the key to advertise. Oh, speaking of advertising, Herky Jerky still has that $10 off thing. Uh, today is the 29th, so we only have a couple more days in January. Please do uh, purchase some delicious Mm, the sticks, okay? I love those. The bacon, put it in a salad, put it on a salad. Please do, uh, you know, go and uh, buy the wares of my friend Jason at herkyjerky.com. Thank you very much. Repetition is the key to advertising. Herky jerky, herky jerky, herky jerky.com. That's why you mention it three times in one commercial and you play the commercials every single day. So if Roger Stone is out on the airwaves and he's saying the same BS every single day, every single day, people start to say, well, nobody would lie that much. Because you wouldn't lie that much. And you project your honesty, your integrity, your decency onto other people. You just assume that you would never lie that much about issues of national security or or, 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 or receiving stolen goods from a foreign hostile government that the intelligence community said had hacked the DNC or in, in April and May. You wouldn't meet with them. You would you know, you just assume that your decency, your integrity, your honesty is what other people do. Now I got to tell you, while most of us do do the right thing when no one's looking or hope to be that good and work towards that goal of doing the right thing when no one's looking, which is the level of integrity that you would teach your kids to have. It's what you want in a person. Roger Stone is not like that. Donald Trump does not have an ounce of that in him. When no one's looking, this is when they will do whatever they need to do to enrich themselves. For them, there are no principles, there are no morals, there is no ground that they, uh, you know, stand upon and and loyally defend. They go wherever the wind blows, wherever the money leads, follow the money, and you'll understand their motivation. And so you had this booker, you had this guy named Andrew Miller. Andrew Miller was Roger Stone's, uh, you know, assistant, right? And... His defense attorney named Paul Kaminar actually talked uh, to CNN and told CNN that he got an assertion from Mueller's team that made clear to him that Robert Mueller and the Department of Justice are considering an additional indictment. An additional indictment. And he feels like that indictment might be of his client, Andrew Miller, who, by the way, stands today in contempt of court. Because he was subpoenaed to testify in front of the grand jury. And he refused to do so because he's Roger Stone's, uh, you know, little protege. And he thinks that he should be as evil and as dark and as sinister and as defiant and as dishonest as Roger Stone. In order to be Roger Stone. That's his, uh, you know, joy in life. Is thinking he could be as crazy as Alex Jones. He could be as nasty as uh, Roger Stone. Uh, he could be as money grubbing as Paul Manafort. Manafort stole, you know, their, their, their stupid lobby shop that lobbied for every dictator that ever walked the face of this planet. And so he refused to testify while he was held in contempt of court. And so in the hearing, the judge made clear to him, to Andrew Miller and his attorney, that Mueller was looking for information that Andrew Miller had about Stone's communications with WikiLeaks and Russian hackers at the time that they were disseminating the stolen goods. And they want him to testify in front of the grand jury, and he has said no. So now he stands in contempt of court, but Roger Stone's been indicted. Now he's saying his, you know what his case is, you know what his lawyer. I mean, this is uh, this is such a, um, this is a circus. Okay, this is just you know, dun, 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 you know, distraction, right? Look over here while I make cards uh, appear over there. So he's saying Mueller was uh, illegally appointed. That's his case, and it's in front of the D.C. Circuit. You know, the D.C. Circuit has had this case since November. They better decide because Mueller would like to talk to Andrew Miller, and in fact, he wants him in front of the grand jury. So if he, you know, if the if if the D.C. Circuit says you need to testify and he still doesn't, 
Okay, there's another indictment. And if he does testify and he lies, there's another indictment. But the D.C. Circuit has the case. Now, his lawyer, Andrew Mueller's lawyer, said, I can only speculate on why they need my client. Uh, the Mueller uh, team, uh, you know, the spokesperson for the special counsel, no comment. The Justice Department guidelines say, and this is interesting, and I want you to try and comprehend this, that a grand jury can only hear evidence after a person is indicted, it, only if the grand jury is continuing to work on new charges for that indicted person. Can't be to hear the same old stuff, right? And so far we know he's been indicted on seven counts. We know it was obstruction of justice, witness tampering, and lying to Congress. So there must be new charges. And the new charges would be the conspiracy. And Andrew Miller turned over all his documents. He turned over everything. And after the uh, Mueller team saw what Andrew Miller had, they want his testimony. And he's in contempt of court. So the guidelines say that a grand jury can't go over the same stuff after a person's indicted. It has to be new charges they're working on against that person that's already been indicted or against additional targets. So I'm just saying this is one guy, right? And we're not even dealing with the, you know, the Eric Prince. We're not even dealing with the junior. We're not even dealing with the Trump himself. We're not dealing with a whole host of people. Plus, everybody forgets who's cooperating. Everybody forgets Flynn. Everybody forgets uh, Gates. Everybody forgets uh, Weisselberg, the CFO of the Trump organization. There's so much left to do. So I don't know why Whitaker did what he did yesterday, but man, he did seem scared. Gotta say, Jeff in Denver, may I help you? How may I direct your call? Hello? Jeff in Denver. Randy? Yes. I'm here. It was me. Oh, it's me. I love cell phones. I have soft, no, it's me. I have soft keys, you know what I mean? They're soft. You have to really press. No worries. Well, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Of course. Uh, Knowing how this administration is dark and I can never go dark enough, I'm going to pose to you about why Whitaker had, like, serious flop sweat. I don't think I've ever seen that much flop sweat ever. I'm glad you noticed. I thought I was the only one that saw it. No, I thought somebody, like, dumped a bucket of water out of it, sent them out. I'm like, what the hell? I'm telling you, you, if you were going through, you know, some screening process or if you were at Border Patrol or if you were trying to enter the country or TSA, they would call the SWAT team if you appeared that way. Yeah, you would be gently excused to the side as quickly as possible. Right. So that being said, what, you know, I start, you know, going as dark as I can because that's what this administration does anymore. Um, I'm going to pose to you that Whitaker got uh, briefed. I'm not even sure if he got briefed fully, but got briefed by Mueller. And I'm wondering if he's like, oh, my God, this guy is a full on traitor. And, you know, at this point, I truly think a lot of the upper tier Republican leadership is uh, complicit with them. Yeah, I do, too. I think uh, obviously a lot of House members are Devin Nunes being one of them. Uh, there's a oh McConnell. I, I cannot believe that McConnell isn't in there. It's weird. It's very weird. The whole thing. So, but yeah, that's probably a good bet. Is that he finally saw the evidence and uh, does he suddenly stress out, going, "Oh my God, I'm shooting my mouth off, and I shouldn't be, and my mouth is running, and my brain should have been engaged." Maybe that. Yeah, I don't know. That would uh, that would take conscience, and to work for Donald Trump, I don't think he could have one. I think what he's scared of is that. Uh, he realizes that Donald Trump is 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 an agent of a foreign government and that it's provable. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm going to go down with this, uh, you know, this bunch. I mean, you know, you'd be. Yeah. Be- yeah. <laughs> you'd be better off being an alcoholic or a cocaine addict. And then, you know, your collapse wouldn't be so public. And in a context, too, it just showed how out of his depth he truly is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm surprised that uh, the next day he's like, I'm resigned. I'm out of here. Uh, you know, <laughs> This is not my shit. But that's what I'm saying. That would be the honorable thing to do is to resign and send a message to everybody that, oh, my God, the evidence is overwhelming and this man is so dirty and you can't even believe what went on. And the election was uh, obviously tampered with and whatever. But, yeah, he would resign because that would send a message. But he has no conscience. So that's why, you know, I think he's like, oh, dear God, this man is just, you know, freaking filthy. And uh, I'm a young guy and I don't want to go to jail for the rest of my life. Oh, I get it. So that's my dark theory. But every time I 
don't think I've gone dark enough on proven wrong. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I used to, I, I have so many callers that used to tell me this stuff was going to happen in the end, and I used to tell them that, you know, you're too dark, this isn't really that bad yet, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, and now there is, because this is the culmination of the corrupt GOP's agenda. Uh, it's always been, you know, to take all the money and keep it for themselves and starve out the people just like Venezuela and make the one big giant deal to steal the last tranches of money and get the hell out of Dodge. I mean, that this is the, the natural result of uh, Newt Gingrich, of the Republican Revolution. Oh, yeah. I, I it, My eyes were really open when I read Naomi Klein. Uh, oh, the shock the doctrine. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Script. That, that I mean, it's, yeah. The, the Chicago Boys, uh, you know, it's a continuous script that they have got a great playbook by. They do. And they've been doing this, uh, you know, incrementally for years and years. They've been doing it in, in other countries, obviously. But, you know, Chile was the example she gave. But they're doing it here now. They're doing it here. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I see it, you know, and I've just people look at me sideways when I say you need to read some of these things. Malcolm uh, Malcolm Nance. Naomi, read a newspaper, read yeah. a newspaper. Even though, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal has stuff that is, you know, showing the pattern of what's going on. Oh, yeah. I mean, all the newspapers do their very, very best to uh, bring the news to you, the real news, the fact check news. They have ombudsmen. They have fact checkers. They have, you know, they run the risk of, uh, you know, defamation and libel and slander if they don't get it right, which is why they get it right. And people just don't want to read it. They just, you know, I mean, I, I could actually tweet something to somebody. And if it comes from the New York Times, they literally will reject it. And so I have to produce the government document that the New York Times relied on. You know, or like in one case, it was about the indictment of Roger Stone. And people on the Internet are saying, well, Roger Stone didn't work on the Trump campaign. And I'm like, I think it was for plausible deniability. He's been friends with Donald Trump for 40 years. He's the one that dreamt up the wall. Him and Sam Nunberg run on this tell tell everybody mexicans are rapists you know uh, get get everybody uh, there's a lot of white supremacists out there that are very quiet and under the you know and uh, you know turn off the lights and the cockroaches will come out play this card say you'll build a wall and mexico will pay for it this was nunberg and stone uh, you know uh, obviously giving Donald Trump and, and if you look there's a movie called get me Roger Stone that is amazing where Roger Stone will say something and then like a week later it comes right out of Trump's mouth so I sent them an article showing them that Roger Stone and Trump have been, it doesn't mean anything it's from the New York Times so then I sent them the indictment of the Russian intelligence operatives that Mueller wrote you know that drew you a a, a, a picture a drawing from the hackers to the Trump, you know, the Trump campaign, and then Roger Stones. I said, so these are the actual indictments. Read them, do the math, and get back to me. And, of course, they go dead silent because they can't read that many pages. Uh, you know, and thank you. Now I know what um, you're referencing. Give me Roger Stone. I always thought it was just that line from that HBO movie about um, Bush stealing the election down there in Florida. Oh, just watch. And I, I forget. No, there's like, so much in there. Stone. No, and you know. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what? Uh, Manafort is in that movie, and you know what Manafort is saying? Manafort says, in the, I can't play it because it's uh, HBO, uh, but Manafort says in there that there's no, you can't tell where Roger Stone ends and Donald Trump begins, and Donald Trump may be running for president, but this is Roger Stone's philosophy that he's, you know, uh, that he's going to sell. Mm-hmm. You know, Brandy, I, I hear the music. Yeah. I'll let you be. Thank and you. you. Finish up. Okay. And I'm telling you, uh, th there's no there's no separation except that, you know, Roger Stone is a dirty trickster who they kept on the outside for plausible deniability, and that's been popped. But you have these cult 45s. you got the Al-Qaeda's the base. you got these crazy maggots. Wow, it's just amazing. All right, we're going to break the format again. I uh, just wanted to let people know who weren't able to see us on YouTube and Facebook and a whole bunch of places where we stream. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other people can hear us on the podcast, obviously. Yes, I'm good. Uh, the other people could hear us on the podcast, which is why we continued on without the video. But I was telling you, we are going to switch. We're going to switch over away from the cables, and we're going to go with fiber optic uh, because of your generosity. I think I'm able to do that now. Uh, and, uh, you know, it in increases the cost for us, but I think we're good. So I'm, we're going to do it. And in that case, we're going to have to take the studio offline for a day uh, and install that and then reprogram all of our stuff. Now, in addition to that, I'm telling you that the piece of equipment that, uh, you know, reset itself in the middle of our day right here, that's what uh, caused the video to drop out. 
we want to replace that and we want to go with a system that's a real, you know, a real broadcasting system. Uh, the first system we had, it's been, you know, good enough for the launch and all that. But now that we're underway, I just want to tell you I have a plan. The plan is going to uh, happen. I don't want to tell you what it is yet. Um, but you're going to like it. You're going to be really, really happy with it. You're going to be thrilled with it. But the piece of equipment that I need uh, to purchase is also a big install. There's a learning curve on it. Poor Brett is going to have to retrain himself to run that thing. Uh, I don't want to say the brand names because I don't need lawsuits or anything like that. But we're going to get a demo of the equipment. We're going to have to go all the way down to like uh, almost to Miami to get a demo of it. Uh, if we think that that's the right piece, and I do, uh, we will purchase it. It is very, very expensive. I mean like tens of thousands of dollars, okay? But we'll do it, and then we'll have to install it and reprogram everything. You know, our board and all that stuff is all, uh, you know, code, and we have to recode everything. So it may be, you know, a day or two days or something like this, but you will be so happy because once we have that kind of professional gear, doors open for us, things that we are... Mm, People want to do stuff, but they can't do it because of the way that I broadcast. So if I change it, uh, you know, things are possible. So I just want to tell you that it's all for good. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, uh, helping us uh, during my birthday. That was really uh, very supportive. So as a lovely gift to you because it's, uh, you know, we're having a polar vortex. <laughs> do you know what the polar vortex is? Okay, just briefly, for these idiots like Donald Trump, who are the leaders of the free world, who still deny that, that climate change is real. The climate has changed. And what it has changed into, while it's freezing here because Arctic air, North Pole weather, is usually not this far south. It's usually kept up by a jet stream in the North Pole. But the jet stream has allowed for the Arctic weather, for the North Pole's weather, to become Chicago's weather, to become Indianapolis's weather, right? It, the, the, the jet stream doesn't keep the North Pole's weather at the North Pole anymore. The jet stream is being moved south by climate change. That's why it's so cold. Meanwhile, while it's so freaking cold, you know you get frostbite in five minutes in some place. School, hundreds of schools are closed today. Government offices are closed today, and he didn't even shut down the government. So much has come to a screeching halt. The Postal Service, through wind and rain and sleet and hail, they've never seen anything like this. These people cannot go outside. They cannot go outside because of this major catastrophe called climate change. Uh, while it's freezing here, it's like freaking steamy hot on the other side of the world. Record temperatures on the other side of the world. So you know what? Uh, Could we just get through the, the, the last few moments of this president, this one, and begin to choose somebody new, begin to choose uh, to live, begin to choose a transparent... You know, the, the corruption report came out yesterday, and we only briefly touched on it, but it's true. The corruption report came out yesterday. We're not even in the top 20 of decent democracies. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We have dropped out of the top 20 countries that aren't legitimately full of corruption. This is sick. This is twisted and this is wrong. The other thing that I was explaining before, uh, you know, uh, you joined us back again on Facebook and YouTube and the other platforms, Periscope and all that, is that Mueller has a new filing today. And the Mueller filing today has to do with the Russians doing what the Russians do, interfere in our election and change American opinion. So this particular filing, while not sexy, uh, not an indictment of anybody you know, and not a brand name indictment, uh, is a response to what the Russians are doing. So first I want to just play Senator Richard Byrd, the Republican from North Carolina, asking the uh, intel community yesterday, what are the Russians doing? Are they still doing it? Okay, just to put it all in context. Is it the IC's assessment that this country's adversaries continue to use U.S. social media platforms as a vehicle for weaponizing disinformation and spreading foreign influence in the United States? Director Ray? Uh, yes, that's certainly the FBI's assessment. Not only have the Russians uh, continued to do it in 2018, but we've seen indication that they're continuing to adapt their model and that other countries are 
taking a very interested eye in that approach. That's China, the other person. It is certainly NSA's assessment as well, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the little voice you heard back there is not the little voice that reads to you. No, it was the uh, NSA cybersecurity uh, head who said, yes, uh, he agrees with what Chris Ray said. And here's what they mean. This is the evidence because we got this filing a day after they testified. Why? Why did we get this filing a day? Because your idiot president, your, your useful idiot president, your Russian agent president tweeted at the intelligence community who testified yesterday that everything that this president says is demonstrably false and that you can't knock him for his foreign policy achievements because he doesn't have any. That's what they said yesterday. Here. We have won against ISIS. We've beaten them, and we've beaten them badly. ISIS is intent on resurging and still commands thousands of fighters in Iraq and Syria. Chairman Kim, we have a great chemistry, (sighs) and we're well on our way. You know, we signed an agreement. It said we will begin the immediate denuclearization. North Korea will seek to retain its WMD capabilities and is unlikely to completely give up its nuclear weapons and production capabilities. I have uh, President Putin. Uh, He just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. Not only have the Russians uh, continued to do it in 2018, but we've seen indication that they're continuing to adapt their model. Okay. What does he mean by adapt their model? All right. This filing tells you what it means. Okay. Uh, The Russians have filed for sensitive information to be disclosed to them. And the reason why Mueller had to go to the court and file and say, we don't want to disclose documents identified by the special counsel as sensitive to Putin's billionaire chef and the employees and officers of Concord, his company, uh, as they're preparing for trial because... Not only did we come to you, the court, and demonstrated good cause for restricting this sensitive material, but we now find that there was a Twitter account set up called Hacking Redstone that included a link to a Russian-hosted site that took the non-sensitive information we provided to uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin of Concord Management, Putin's billionaire chef, but altered it and tried to make it seem like Mueller had nothing to discredit his investigation. That's it in a nutshell, okay? And they found out that this uh, you know, website and this Twitter account were hosted by Russians who are outside of their juris- jurisdiction and we have no way of, uh, you know, prosecuting them for doing this stuff. But yet they still seek to find these cult 45 members, target them. They still yearn to, te- uh, to, 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 to talk to al-Qaeda, the base of Trump's party. They st- and these tweets are received by cult 45 with open arms and open minds and open... And they try to read these files... Half of the files are the real files, and the other half are completely phonied to make it look like this is all he has. He has nothing else. Concord didn't do anything. Russians didn't meddle. It's all a load of crap. Here's the story. And you know I love his indictments because they read like once upon a time there was, right? So they start off once upon a time on June 29th. They don't say once upon a time. On June 29th, 2018. This court entered a protective order that included provisions restricting the disclosure of material designated by our government as being sensitive. The protective order barred any individual or entity, including Concord, including their officers, Yevgeny Prigozhin, other than a U.S. defense team from sharing, accessing, discussing sensitive discovery materials without the court's approval. That order required that sensitive discovery materials be stored offline because they knew 
So these sensitive materials are not online. So for anybody who thinks that they read sensitive materials from Bob Mueller because uh, hacking Redstone led you to some uh, Russian-hosted webpage that you thought was a real American webpage, uh, that was bull crap. That is Russian disinformation, a campaign being launched yet again in 2018 to make you think that Mueller doesn't have the necessary goods or evidence about this Russian troll farm paid for by Putin's chef. The material that Mueller has is stored offline. I can even tell you where. They're at the offices of Reed Smith. They are not disclosed. They are not to be transported or transmitted. They're offline. And they certainly are barred from being transmitted, stored, or disclosed outside of the United States. The the, the protective order that was entered into by the court before he charged Concord required that any person reviewing the sensitive material must be accompanied at all times by a designated and identified employee of a U.S. office of Reed Smith. So whatever they are tweeting out, whatever Russian crap they're putting out there for the, for, 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 for the cult 45 members, for the maggots, is fake. It's fake Russian disinformation. The court, in its order, classifying, you know, granting Mueller uh, all this, uh, you know, shouldn't be disseminated, shouldn't be transmitted, shouldn't be, nobody outside the United States gets it, this material is under seal, and it's kept offline, and if somebody needed to read it, then they needed to go with somebody who was designated and identified by Reed Smith's office, who they have uh, chosen, and everybody agrees on, that this would be, you know, like, um, you remember when uh, they they wanted, like, a a middle-of-the-ground lawyer to vet uh, what was uh, gained in Michael Cohen's office because it was a lawyer's office, same with Manafort. So they had a designee that the court chose who would vet this material to see if anything was protected under attorney-client privilege. This is the same situation, same kind of situation, where they, everybody agreed that this would be the, uh, the go-between, the, the, the middleman who would store offline these documents. Anyway, the court wrote in its uh, opinion that these restrictions were warranted based on its finding that the government had demonstrated good cause for restricting sensitive discovery material, meaning material that they uncovered during their investigation. The court noted that the sensitive discovery, quote, includes information describing the government's investigative techniques, identities of the cooperating individuals and companies, and personal identifying information related to U.S. persons who were victims of identity theft. These substantial considerations, the court concluded, constitute ample good cause for imposition of a protective order. Then he goes on to describe, uh, you know, the, the, the other inclusions in this protective order that allows defense counsel for the Concord manager for Yevgeny to seek ex parte approval to disclose sensitive discovery materials to others, including Concord's individuals and officer, uh, officers, including Prigozhin. So it said that there would be a firewall, a firewall counsel, somebody in between the Russian defendant, Yevgeny Prigozhin, and anybody that worked for Concord who paid the trolls, in the St. Petersburg troll farm. There would be a firewall uh, uh, council. Not a member of the prosecution team. Okay? So that they would have some intermediary who would be vetting all this stuff and deciding what he could have to defend himself so that the court could carefully balance our national security, the weighty law enforcement needs and privacy concerns so that Concord couldn't disseminate this information widely, right? So that's what they agreed to. Well, 
what happened was the non-sensitive information that they were given, the same non-sensitive information that uh, we have, they altered it. This Twitter account called Hacking Redstone tweeted a link to a Russian-hosted website that included files that were wholly made up, wholly written by the Russians to pretend that Mueller didn't have anything. To speak to Randy, call now, you bastards. 561-270-3844. Hello, hello. Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes. Air Force. Hello, I'm Casey Hobbs. And I'm Shane Mason, and we're the hosts of Nurse Talk Radio. Here's what we're talking about this week. So what is the Medicare buy-in we hear about? Is it a desirable plan? Why or why not? Well, um, sometimes it's called a public option. Sometimes it's called Medicare buy-in. A lot of folks have been using the term Medicare for all to describe this public option, I think, to intentionally create confusion. But a public option is, is not a universal health care system. Uh, basically, it, will, it would allow you to purchase a private health plan from the government instead of a private health plan from, you know, a commercial insurance company. And, you know, there's arguments about whether that would be an improvement or not. You know, I don't think it would be a bad thing. I don't think it would be the end of the world. Uh, but it's not going to make a major difference to you. I, I mean, if your problem is that you can't afford health insurance, a public option is not going to bring down the cost of health plan so much that suddenly it's going to be affordable to you. If you have co-payments and deductibles in your existing plan that right now even getting the care you need is hard, having another health plan competing in the market is not going to make a, a big difference to that. So it's not the kind of change we need. And crucially, it doesn't control costs at the same time that it extends coverage to everyone. So folks, I think, need to be wary about and kind of educate themselves and the folks around them that uh, this is not the same thing. When you talk about a Medicare buy-in, you're just talking about one more thing you can purchase, an insurance product that's not going to be adequate for your needs. And that is totally different from Medicare for All, which means everyone gets comprehensive coverage as a right uh, from the first day you're born until the last day uh, before you pass away. And who do you think's talking about that? Is that Republicans <laughs> trying to delude the whole conversation of moving forward with single payer? I think it's, it's more uh, there's a certain wing of the Democratic Party that doesn't want to alienate the healthcare industry, doesn't want to run up against them. And there's the Center for American Progress is probably going to be leading a lot of this stuff. Um, so there's a collection of national think tanks and uh, leaders in Congress who are sort of trying to pilot a course to do something small and moderate that looks like they're addressing the healthcare crisis, but that is not really going to have a significant impact in providing relief to the people who are really being impacted. So, Ben, what can we do to really move this movement when Trump and his minions seem intent on killing the ACA Obamacare even and even damaging the Medicaid expansion? Well, you know, I think the last two years were a pretty good example when people were showing up to these town hall meetings, shutting down their members of Congress. Thanks for listening. You can find more information about these topics at nursetalksite.com or nationalnursesunited.org. This podcast is powered by National Nurses United, the nation's largest union for registered nurses. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network, and here's a clip from Tara Buster with Tara Devlin. During the shutdown, I kept hearing uh, representatives, whenever they get on TV, of course, they have to throw out the obligatory, we are the greatest country on earth. Really? Um... If we were the greatest country on earth, why is it that 70-something percent of people can't miss one paycheck without it all crumbling down? But you see, that's how they like it. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. His worldview 
is a very primitive one. It's narrow, shallow, and short-term, when what we need is wider, deeper, and longer. You know, we had on Cliff Sims. Um, he was in the White House. Uh, he was the, I guess, media strategy guy. He has a new tell-all book out. And what he said was that there's something about Donald Trump that changes the character of the people around him. He changes their moral compass. How there is does he no do question. That? Listen, I'm an example of it. Uh, you know, I've been in I've been in penance for 30 years over it. And he he did this to me, pulled me into something that violated my own values. Yeah. His values violated my values. He absolutely does that. And it makes this an incredibly depressing time. I find myself angrier moment to moment, day to day, than I would have been two years ago if there were no Trump. And I think that's across the population. He disrupts your, he disrupts you, is what he does. How? Um, because he is so relentless, number one. He comes at you and comes at you and comes at you. You've described the, var the variety of ways in which he does that. And he has no conscience. Hmm. So he is willing to say anything to lie, to deceive, to distort, and not feel the slightest bit of guilt about it. And he throws anybody off. So we're, we're operating. This is what you get. I said this in 2016. I haven't used this word that much since then, but it's absolutely so. He's a sociopath. Mm. He's sociopathic. And Meaning what? Meaning the absence of conscience. It means there isn't a soul in there. There isn't, Ugh. there's not only not a heart because he doesn't have that, but there's not a soul. There's not some, there's not an internal barometer. There's no true north. There's no true north. And you know, that's a lot of words to say something I've been telling you for a very long time. And I know this from experience. Narcissists are contagious. I had that happen to me. I actually had a narcissist in my life who changed my moral compass, who changed the way that I dealt with other people, who changed everything about me because they're constant and they're consistent and they come at you and they come at you and they come at you and, and, and they change you because they're contagious. They're contagious. And you don't want to uh, upset them because they are the darkness. And their anger and their uh, uh, retaliatory nature makes it impossible, impossible for you to speak up for yourself. Because you know that if you do, the wrath, the endless wrath, the retaliation, everything, any secret you've ever shared, anything, it all becomes fodder to embarrass you, to hurt you, to demean you, to diminish you. And, you know, I'm a very strong person. It happened to me. It really did. Some people are aware of who that person is. Other people never bothered to ask, but they saw it. They saw it. They were there. They experienced that person. They understand what I'm saying now, but they never bothered to ask, are you okay? Because something has changed. Are you okay? That's what happens when you have a person who has no soul. That's what happens when a narcissist is in your life. They are contagious and they infect people and infest your life with their, their desire. And the reason why they're like that, in my experience, is because if they felt their feelings, they would implode. They would literally implode. They would have an episode of total disconnection because all their feelings would suddenly be things they felt. And the pain of it, the, 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 the cognition that they did these things would be too much for them and they would just implode. And that is what a narcissist is. So that's Tony Schwartz who wrote The Art of the Deal. Donald Trump did not write The Art of the Deal. And uh, he's saying that he feels even worse now watching Donald Trump be unleashed on America. And there is no disagreement among 60% of these United States. 
okay? The the, the, the 40% or the 37% or the 33% or that little, those MAGA people, they latch on to all this Russian propaganda, to all the BS that goes on on Fox News. You know, I mean, there was a, there was a story in the newspaper about how, uh, you know, and we saw this, Bolton the other day, he had a notepad and uh, he was in public and his notepad said 5,000 troops to Colombia. In the middle of all this, uh, you know, contratemps over Venezuela, uh, selling their oil fields to Russia, and in exchange, Russia gave Maduro a billion and a half dollars and military help. And of course, the people in uh, Venezuela are th- even the last bitter enders, the last bitter clingers to Maduro are now, you know, we want them gone. We've had enough. There's no food. There's, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's hyperinflation, uh, you know, uh, uh, an ear of corn and a tortilla is $50. And they've had it, right? And they understand that he was, uh, that he was an oligarch and that he was corrupt. And they want him gone. But the one part of the government that still backs Maduro is the military. And some of the military wants to defect away from him. And they're asking the United States for help to defect. We don't need to go to war. You know, I mean, it's always like, and these, these bitter enders, these, you know, they always, oh, we need to go to war. No, 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 there's a million things you can do ahead of war, but we don't have the will. Donald Trump, so anyway, Bolton was in public and on his notepad facing outward toward the camera, it said 5,000 troops to Columbia. And I, me and Scotty were like, oh my God, no, that this really, uh, that, it turns out that there's a lot of notes a lot of notes that they've been, uh, you know, showing to the cameras. It's almost like, uh, you know, they're crying for help, these people. It's really uh, creepy. And he keeps feeding the base lies in order to keep them on his side, like the bitter enders in uh, Venezuela. It's really, I mean, he, he is dangerous. And, and people, you know, here, here's a Rear Admiral. Uh, this is a Rear Admiral John Kirby saying that this man is willfully ignorant, okay? That he is a witting accomplice, not an unwitting accomplice. That he is a witting accomplice and that he is dangerous. This is not really a difference of opinion here, right? Because it, it, it's a difference of facts. The president is claiming a different reality than U.S. intelligence, mm-hmm. intelligence agencies with all of their resources are telling him is that dangerous for a president uh, to stake out positions that are not backed by any intelligence we're aware of, but backed by his own view of the world? Is that dangerous for U.S. national security? Yeah, I'm worried about that, uh, Jim. In the, in the cases that were brought up yesterday in terms of Iran, North Korea, Syria, ISIS, th- those things are serious issues uh, which we are trying to grapple with, not just from a national policy perspective, but in coordination with allies and partners. And when the president distances himself like that from his intelligence chiefs, it, it worries me on two fronts. One, it's not a different. It's not a different uh, 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 taking of the facts, if, if you were. It's ignorance. It's willful ignorance. And so mm. it concerns me that my president, my commander in chief, isn't absorbing the context that these guys provide. And it's not all perfect. They under, you know, intelligence is an imperfect science at best. Number two, it, it, I worry that it sends a strong message to our adversaries out there, particularly Russia and China, uh, that there are huge gaps remaining in the national security decision-making apparatus in this country, and that they can run right through those gaps uh, and try to further sow discord and division uh, amongst ourselves. And that really scares me. That's what is happening. The fake news exists, but it exists in Russia. The fake news exists, but it exists on Twitter. The fake news exists, but it is on fake Facebook accounts. Okay, fake Instagram accounts. And the reason why Mueller had to file this, the reason why we know about this is because A journalist on October 22nd, just last October, this Twitter account, Hacking Redstone, published this tweet that I told you. We've got access to the special counsel Mueller's probes database. We hacked a Russian server with info from the Russian troll case, Concord versus Mueller. You can view all the files Mueller had about the 
uh, Internet Research Agency and Russian collusion. Enjoy the reading. That tweet included a link to a web page that locate that that um, moved you over to a file sharing portal. Okay, and it contained three hundred thousand files, and most of them were fake. And you know how we know about that? Real news. A real journalist. And this person is unnamed. But this person, whoever you are, you're a hero or a heroine. I don't know. But on October 22nd, a reporter contacted Mueller's office because that reporter was direct messaged on Twitter by an individual who said they got the discovery material by hacking into a Russian law firm that had stolen it from Reed Smith. The firewall council, except the firewall council, Reed Smith, stores everything offline. None of what he has is online. And so the journalist said that he or she was able to view and download the files from some Russian legal company's database through a remote server. Some of the files used the same labels as Mueller's, and other files were made-up files that were managed on some site called Relativity that Mueller never used, and that was their clue that it was fake news being disseminated to the maggots, being disseminated to Cult 45 to convince them that there was no Russia thing. There was no collusion. There was no conspiracy. uh, And it was fake news. And a real journalist reported it to Mueller. And that real journalist was contacted by a Russian through a direct message, same as Roger Stone and Guccifer and God knows what else, right? And that's... How Mueller uh, was clued in. So thank God for real reporters. Thank God for real journalism. Thank God there are people who are the fourth estate in this country. And the kind of swill and and threats that they've had to endure from the maggots, from, from, from the cult 45s, from Trump standing on a stage and telling them, turn around, look at that, see that back there? That's the fake news. Pulling Jim Acosta's press pass and doing all this, this nasty, nasty attack. Barbara Starr, you walk the halls uh, of the Pentagon. You speak to officials there. What is the reaction there when, when officials see the president deny, in effect, what they're telling him? For instance, about ISIS still being present in Syria. ISIS, North Korea, and the latest this morning, uh, as you guys said a couple of seconds ago, the president uh, going after intelligence community leaders full bore, saying that they are uh, extremely passive and naive when it comes to Iran. They are wrong. If the president of the United States believes his intelligence community is passive, naive, and wrong, one of the questions is, why does he keep them? Should he be firing all of them? Uh, You know, remember, Defense Secretary Jim Mattis resigned, did not get fired, as the president said, resigned because he felt he wasn't being listened to. And that's the fundamental question here. Or is the intelligence community even being listened to by the president? And can they continue on uh, when they see this kind of language from him? I think it is very fair to say the intelligence community actually watches Iran very closely around the clock and pretty much knows uh, everything that they are up to especially their new weapons, their missile testing, their activities inside of Syria, the uh, militias that they are backing, Hezbollah, the threat that they pose to Israel. One could go on and on, including their nuclear program. On the question of ISIS, you see that fundamental shift, that fundamental contradiction. What the intelligence community is saying is something very precise, which is, you know, this is not a win or lose. ISIS has still, according to the director of national intelligence, has thousands of fighters out there while the president is saying the caliphate is disappearing, that we are winning against the caliphate. I think what the intelligence community is trying to communicate to the president, there's no win or lose. You have to keep working at all of these problems. Yeah, but him and Pence are very busy being out there telling you, uh, hey, we defeated ISIS and Iran is, uh, North Korea is denuclearizing. 
And, uh, you know, we, uh, Russia's fine. We have no threat. The real threat is the southern border. We got a crisis. We got a national murder. You know what was interesting about the threat assessment yesterday? You only get this once a year. That's all you get. The intelligence community testifies once a year about the threats facing currently the United States of America. Not one of them said that there is a, uh, you know, southern border crisis, a national emergency, something that needs, uh, you know, immediate attention. Oh, hell no. They were talking about China and Russia joining together to disrupt American democracy, to take America's place in the world, to de-incentivize other democratic countries from believing that democracy can work or does work, and that, uh, you know, oligarchy or communism or some weird mashup of communism and oligarchy and making yourself leader for life is a better deal. This is right out of the dictator's playbook. And then doing it by setting one of us upon the other. I, this is so sick, I can't even tell you, okay? And uh, even Joe Manchin, you know, Joe Manchin, he could go either way. You know how he is. He's very bi, very, very bi, partisan. He could go either way. And he's saying, you know what? Uh, this this Trump thing is uh, it's not working. And as far as the southern border goes, yeah, we know there's no national emergency. We know there's no threat there. And the best thing that's on the table is still that deal from 2013, the one that I keep talking to you about, the one that um, uh, everybody, uh, the Gang of Eight, the bipartisan group, put out of the Senate, voted out of the Senate, and then idiot boy uh, Ryan over in the House wouldn't take it up, wouldn't vote on it, nothing. And now they sit there, the, 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 the Kevin McCarthy's of the world and the, and the freedom crackers. Oh, this is the Democrats' fault. Bull crap. We voted for $46 billion in border security in 2013, a bipartisan piece of legislation. And those freedom crackers wouldn't take it up. That's number one. Number two... There was another bipartisan piece of legislation where the Democrats agreed to give idiot boy the whole $25 billion for the stupid, stupid wall in exchange for a path to citizenship for the DACA kids. And he turned it down. He could have had all his freaking stupid, could have declared victory. But he's such a good negotiator that he actually said no when they said yes. And shut down the government for 35 freaking days. It's ridiculous. You voted for plans that would include new funding for the wall. You voted for plans that include an increase in spending for border security, but no new funding. You just wanted the government open. Those were where your votes were. Senators Alexander and Shelby have said that maybe the president should stay out of the negotiations. Stay for out now. of Let it. Let the appropriators meet and have their discussions. Do you agree with these senators? Well, I agree that basically that we are a separate branch of government. Article 1 of the Constitution is very clear. We have equal powers. And if senators can agree, representing a diverse group of constituents, and come to an agreement of what they think would be acceptable when they go home and explain it, I would hope the president would work with them. I think the president needs to open up and look at, basically, how about these DACA? How about these children that came in at very young ages with their parents, no matter if they came with their parents the wrong way, they had no, uh, no uh, challenge over that or they had no choice Say. of that. And now they've become productive citizens. They're in our military. They're in our schools and education. They're in our economy. They're in our society. Shouldn't they have a pathway forward? So the president needs to look at that, too, rather than just basically a three-year protective status and give them a pathway forward to a citizenship. And that's what needs to be done. That's really what's preventing us, John, from getting to a final deal. One of the architects of the president's immigration plans and policies, not just towards undocumented immigrants, but also refugees, has been Stephen Miller, the president's speechwriter and, and policy <laughs> advisor. There's this new book out by Cliff Sims, who did work at the White House, who quotes Stephen Miller as saying, I would be happy if not a single refugee foot ever again touched American soil. Yeah. Well, I'm sure his ancestors uh, uh, would have had a different opinion of that and probably do have a different opinion even today because all of us came here from some place, some way. Someone allowed us to come and contribute and be a part of this great, this great experiment of democracy. 
That's all people are asking for. I've said this. People come, John, for the wrong way for the right reason. They came the wrong way for the wrong reason. We want to get rid of the people that came for the wrong reason. It's basically mm -hmm. committed crimes and taken advantage of our society or, and, and th threat to our people. But you have to have a security mm -hmm. on the border to keep them out. But on the other hand, can't there be a pathway forward? Look at the 2013 bill. It was an ab absolutely compromised bill between Democrats and Republicans that was a grand plan. It's still the best thing on the table. Huh. We would not be having this conversation. We mm -hmm. could be working on many, many other important mm -hmm. problems and challenges we have. Do you think the president is being pulled uh, in an anti-immigrant direction by advisors like Stephen Miller? I sure do. I absolutely do. So even Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who's very bi, uh, could go either way on anything and does all the time, is saying that the white supremacists in the Trump administration are the ones that are creating this crisis and creating this fear in this country on brown people. However, yesterday, when the intelligence chiefs testified about the threats that the United States face, they, no one said, we have a threat on the southern border. Not one of them said brown people. They said the freaking Caucasians, the white people from the Caucasus, the Russians. They're the biggest threat. They're tearing our country apart. We don't have an emergency at the border. Uh, the contradictions between what our intelligence agencies have to say about North Korea's plans to denuclearize or the, the status uh, of ISIS in Syria or elsewhere and what the president has been promoting. Uh, it's obviously very important that the American people understand the truth uh, mm -hmm. and what we know about the threats facing the country. You know, I will say this also, though, that glaring absence that you talked about earlier, the fact that none of the intel chiefs brought up a threat at the southern border mm -hmm. as being one of the most pressing threats facing the country, <laughs> that could be exhibit A in a challenge to any kind of a declaration of a national emergency. Yep. The fact that none of our intelligence agencies think it's an emergency, the fact that Congress uh, on both parties uh, don't think this is an emergency. Huh. Uh, I think if anything is going to undermine that legal case that the president may try to make, uh, that hearing yesterday could be a central exhibit. Because he's a jackass. Because he's a divider. Because he's a hater. Because he's a narcissist. Because he's a coward. Because he's a, he's a mealy-mouthed son of a bitch is what he is. I got to tell you, remember when we were talking about the shutdown and I said, how is it possible that he shut down the government and the exact people that are in charge of keeping this country safe and moving these cases along are the ones that aren't getting paid? How is it possible that his desire was to keep the country safe from some threat in his head by not paying the Border Patrol? How, how, how is it possible that he's keeping the country safe by not paying judges who Three out of four of them who do immigration, uh, there's only, there, there, there's 60 courts in this country that do immigration cases. There's a total of 400 immigration judges. And three out of four of those immigration judges weren't getting paid during his ridiculous shutdown that literally made people choose between chemotherapy and paying their mortgage. I mean, the harm that this man did. So today... There's a, uh, the Daily Beast reports that the judges say that the shutdown broke the immigration system for years to come. It will take them years to make up the cases that they weren't able to hear during his stupid shutdown of the same people that need to appear because they're claiming asylum. And the judges say, dump the wall dump the 2,000 mile wall and instead double the number of immigration judges to deal with these cases. Well, here's a little flashback for you. Here was the first time that anybody suggested that we get more judges. This is when the family separation stuff was going on and kids were in cages and, and, and video and audio of kids crying. Dad, dad, oh God, that heartbreaking it was like four or five minutes of this kid just crying so hard that you, the, the kid was going to bite their tongue, okay? You ever cry that hard where you bite, bite your own tongue? That 
is deep. I think everybody just went, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah. Well, here was Trump. They asked him, why don't you just hire more judges? I don't want any judges. And we don't need no stinking judges. So what I'm asking Congress to do is to give us a third option, which we have been requesting since last year, the legal authority to detain and promptly remove families together as a unit. We have to be able to do this. This is the only solution to the border crisis. There is no crisis. We have to stop you are the crisis. child smuggling. This <laughs> is the way to do it. And ultimately, we have to have a real border, not judges. Thousands and thousands of judges they want to hire. Yeah. Who are these people? When we vet a single federal judge, it goes through a big process. Everybody that's ever met her or him, they come, they complain, they don't complain, they say he's brilliant, she's brilliant, he's not smart enough to be a judge. Now we're hiring thousands and thousands. What country does this? Judge Dana Lee Marks, an immigration judge in San Francisco and president emeritus of the National Association of Immigration Judges, said the current roster of roughly 400 judges is less than half of what we need. I've got a million, literally a million, cases backlogged. We need a thousand judges. We're having a tsunami of retirements because working conditions have become so unbearable. It's incredibly stressful because we know that the consequences of our cases are literally life and death. The Department of Justice, which oversees the immigration court system, already had a crisis on its hands before he shut down the government. Judge Marks said, with a backlog of at least 800,000 cases in a system with too few judges and too little funding, judges have become, in a way, the sacrificial lamb in this process. She said, we have 60 courts, we have 400 judges and a million immigration cases, and those 400 keep this system moving. They're supposed to do four three-hour hearings per day and they bring people in like it's traffic court. They bring them in, you know, like uh, 20, 30 at a time. She says, you know, we have to speed through the backlog. The Department of Justice said in April it's going to impose quotas on the judges. They have to do 700 immigration cases a year to earn a satisfactory performance rating. And 15 percent or less of their cases have to go to a higher court. So they have to increase the speed of their adjudications and decrease the errors that could lead to appeal at the same time. It's impossible. And this president wants his stupid wall for his stupid, ignorant base. The Randy Rhodes Air Force. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Happy New Year, Herky Turkey fans. We certainly hope you had a festive holiday season and wish you a very prosperous 2019. It was so nice to hear all the positive feedback from customers who purchased Turkey Jerky products during December, either as gifts or for yourself. The feedback from the holiday special of the $10 off orders over $50 and free shipping was so well received that my favorite jerky makers decided to continue it into January. So let's keep it rolling. For the rest of the month, all qualifying orders get the same discount and free shipping, no promo code necessary. All natural turkey jerky continues to be the top seller, but the four flavors of nitrite and preservative free beef jerky, close second. Many of the longest running Herky Jerky customers still prefer the meat sticks like me, and why not? The venison, elk, and buffalo sticks and the beef smokies are the best on the market. And the bacon jerky, oh yeah, it's still delicious. So keep taking advantage of the savings and Herky Jerky will continue producing the jerky you love. And thanks again for supporting our sponsor, Herky Jerky. Just visit HerkyJerky.com. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. And here's a clip from Tara Buster with Tara Devlin. So they were saying that Trump was fighting. That was it. Oh, he's fighting for his wall. First of all, wasn't it true that Mexico was supposed to pay for this effing wall? Why is he taking us hostage? And he's not fighting. You're not fighting. What the hell is he doing? He's, he has absolutely nothing on his schedule. 
He was doing nothing. He was tweeting and eating carcasses, as many carcasses as he can shove in his fat gullet mouth. He was fighting by causing Americans to not have a paycheck. That's how he fights? How much suffering he can inflict on other people? So we don't have our food inspected. What about the Coast Guard? They're not getting paid. Then you have the air traffic controllers not getting paid. Because that's how much they don't respect you as a worker. That's why the working class of this country, we need a, Trump wants a shutdown. We need a shutdown. We need a big shutdown, a real strong, hard, big, enormous, engorged shutdown. Well, you know what we really need is a damn general strike. All of the working class, we need to shut it down. For a day, we sit down. That's it. Nothing moves. You want to put a fear up the spine of every oligarch, every Republican? The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. So I just realized that I was talking to you about the polar vortex and I didn't explain to you what your gift is. Some of you in the colder climes have been asking us here in Florida to make you long sleeve Randy Rhodes t-shirts, that very fierce, beautiful Air Force Randy Rhodes t-shirt. And we've done it, they're done, they're there. See, that's that's the boys. We have a girls also. Uh, they are very, very good looking. I think they came out great. Do you love that? I love that. You see how the uh, microphone is right in the cleavage area. I just think that's very flattering. I do, I think it uh, presents a nice slim line, a nice long line. So they are on sale now at RandyRhodes.com. And this money that, uh, you know, uh, we raised from selling these will obviously go to the purchasing of the new equipment that is super expensive. And then we'll be able to make an announcement that I think you will like. So I'm always looking. I'm always looking to make you happy. It's a win-win is what it is. Those long sleeves T-shirts are really nice. And the other thing that we're considering making – uh, for the spring might be a hoodie, but I'm having um, our the, the the man who makes my T-shirts. His name's Jack. Hey, Jack. Uh, Jack makes my uh, T-shirts. Jack is very very good at this. Uh, he's sending me a hoodie, and if I like it, if it's a good one, if it's quality, and I can keep the price you know reasonable, then we'll do a hoodie also for uh, the spring. Anyway, I digress. Please go. You know, just go to RadyRoads.com, and in the top. Right-hand corner, there's a white oval, and it says merch, as in merchandise. Uh, that's where you can buy them. And, you know, we're very good at getting them to you. So, anyway, here is Donald Trump lying about things that matter. Shocking, I know. But it matters. It matters. You know why? We have until February 15th, I swear to God, to prevent one of two scenarios— And then we have until March to prevent a third devastating scenario. So here's what's coming. Next week is going to give the State of the Union on Tuesday. Wednesday, we don't know if Michael Cohen is going to be testifying in public at the Oversight Committee. uh, Thursday, Michael Cohen is going to testify at the House Intelligence Committee non-publicly behind closed doors. That is on because today... The majority leader, Kevin McCarthy, who who really is just as criminally guilty as uh, everybody else, put Devin Nunes back on the Intelligence uh, Committee. Why that man is still on the Intelligence Committee after we know he runs over to the White House and tells him everything uh, is beyond me. But the majority leader, just like the Speaker of the House, controls all the committee memberships. So he put Nunes... McCarthy put Nunes back on Intel. So anyway, they've now formed the committee. The committee is whole, and they can take the testimony of Michael Cohn. So that'll happen on Thursday. Then on the 12th, Michael Cohn will testify in front of the uh, – well, he'll testify behind closed doors at the Senate Intelligence Committee and give his uh, uh, testimony to them. And then on the 15th of February – we will have either the president take unto himself a very dubious legal argument 
that was just completely destroyed yesterday by our national security experts, who you may like or not like, because Gene Haspel, for me, will always be the torture meister, always. Uh, the CIA, the DNI, the FBI, counterintelligence, and the cybersecurity experts at NSA all testified yesterday. There is no threat to the United States sovereignty or any other emergency at the southern border, but he's going to make a dubious legal case, either that he needs to declare a national emergency so he can move money around, or he's going to start another debilitating government shutdown over the stupid border wall because it doesn't look like there will be a deal to give this president $5.7 billion for his stupid, stupid down payment on his stupid border wall that Mexico is supposed to pay for. Then in March, as if you will not have been through enough in February, we are facing defaulting on our debt. I mean, literally taking the United States bankrupt. Now think about who the president is. Think about who Wilbur Ross, our Commerce Secretary, is. These are the kings of making money in bankruptcy. These are the people that in chaos they can steal, okay? And so Lindsey Graham, little Lindsey, is saying, you know, when we figure out this uh, wall thing, when we do this bill, which doesn't look like it's going to get done, I mean, the talks haven't even begun, and the idea of getting to agreement is, is, is essentially dead as of today. They haven't even met yet. It's essentially dead. Know why? The Democrats are not going to use the DACA kids as bargaining chips. They have already offered the president $25 billion for his stupid, stupid wall in exchange for a path to citizenship for the DACA kids. And he walked away and he turned it down. Then they did a bill that had uh, all kinds of border security in it. uh, And he turned that down and he shut down the government. So then they got a clean continuing resolution to take us through February. And it doesn't include any money for anything. And the Democrats are saying we're not going to use these DACA kids as bargaining bargaining chips because we don't trust you. We don't think that you will provide a permanent fix for these young undocumented after you rejected the same kind of a deal before. So we just don't trust you. Your word means nothing because you lie. So we're not going to do that. So Lindsay said, you know what we should do then? figure out what to do about the debt ceiling. We have to raise the debt ceiling. And if we don't do it in this particular moment, we're just going to be back here again and the president is going to default the United States and create all kinds of chaos. So he wants to throw that into these conversations. The reason why you can't do business with this president is because this president reverses himself, changes his mind, says he'll do a clean DACA bill to Dianne Feinstein. Then you had Mark Meadows sit in there, Kevin McCarthy. No, 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 Mr. President, I don't think you know what you just gave away because he doesn't know what he's doing. And he is the worst negotiator ever. You want to make a million dollars? Give Donald Trump a billion and he'll turn it into a million. He is the worst. His father left him $412 million. This man went bankrupt six times. Human traffickers. Oh, please. The victims are women. Oh, my God. And children. Oh, my God. Maybe to a lesser extent, Mm. believe it or not, children. Women are tied up. They're bound. (laughs) Duct tape put around their faces, around their mouths. In many cases, they can't even breathe. They're put in the backs of cars or vans or trucks. (laughs) They don't go through your port of entry. They make a right turn going very quickly. They go into the desert areas or whatever areas you can look at. And as soon as there's no protection, they make a left or a right into the United States of America. There's nobody to catch them. There's nobody to find them. They can't come through the port. Because if they come through the port, people will see four women sitting in a van (laughs) with tape around their face and around their mouth. Can't have that. You know, I thought maybe he watched weird porn. And that's where he got. But then, 
He may still be. But then yesterday we had a caller, a caller who said, and I don't know if we got played or if this, because this was on the TV or so, I, I don't know what happened there. But all of a sudden, CNN and other uh, networks started to explain to you last night that this rape fantasy that he has came out of the movie Sicario Day of the Soldado. Now, yesterday we had a caller who said he was an extra in Sicario Day of the Soldado and that the cast of Sicario Day of the Soldado, the sequel to Sicario, which was probably so good that it had to have a sequel, uh, were cheering that Trump was promoting their movie with this uh, crazy, uh, you know, uh, fantasy that he's having about duct tape and rape because it's in the movie. It's in the movie. So I don't know which way this worked. I don't know if, uh, you know, uh, other networks were listening to our show and, you know, because a lot of times we're ahead of them. Uh, or if he had seen it on TV and just, you know, decided that that's the way he would call in and, you know, say that. But the president has claimed that women are being taped up and trafficked via the southern border. And, of course, that has been roundly disputed by people who work on human trafficking issues. Now, by the way, most of the women who are trafficked in this country are American girls. And it's, you know, uh, it's a drug thing. And it's disgusting. The other, the other thing that I'm aware of, uh, when I lived in New York, women coming in from the Caucasus, Russian girls, Ukrainian girls, Moldovan girls, a lot of girls from Moldova, were being trafficked into the United States. Their passports were being taken away when they got here, and they weren't allowed to leave. They were forced to work as a working girl, a call girl, a prostitute, whatever, and give the money to the guy who held their passport. And when that guy figured uh, that it was enough money, maybe he would give her back her passport. That's human trafficking. And the human trafficking experts all said that Donald Trump saying that this is happening at the southern border is divorced from reality. This is from people who work in legal services at the National Immigrant Justice Center. This is, uh, you know, interviews with a number, a number of lawyers, a number of human trafficking experts that say that that is not a fact pattern that you see on the southern border, that, uh, you know, it, it, it that it is really a plot point in the Sicario franchise. That just like he lifts his language from Goodfellas and just like uh, Roger Stone uh, told Randy Credico to pull a Frank Pantangeli, tell me I wasn't ahead of that one. And that that was in Mueller's indictment of Roger Stone, that he actually typed that to Randy Credico. Pull uh, Frank Pantangeli. Just appear before Congress and say, yeah, sure, the FBI offered me a deal. So I said this about Michael Corleone, and I said that about Michael Corleone, and yeah, sure. Because his brother was threatened with, uh, you know, whatever. Just appearing was enough. And Michael said, uh, you know, when Kay asked, what was that about? It's between the brothers, okay, right? So that was actually in the indictment of Roger Stone. So just like they're lifting language from The Godfather, just like they're li lifting language from Godfather 2, just like they're lifting language from Goodfellas, you're a rat, you're a rat, you come from a family of rats, right, that? What does he do? He picks up the phone and he, she calls from the house. You know what I mean? Michael Cohn could do whatever he wants. I mean, just like they lift the language right from the movie. They're saying he's lifting this scenario right from uh, Sicario, Day of the Soldado. Hey, by the way, Randy, yeah. uh, I just got confirmation from our Facebook chat room. Yes. Uh, John is a real person. Oh, he is? Yes, he's a real actor. Yes. And he really was an extra in that movie. So then the media followed us. Uh, I think it was on one of the other shows on uh, Monday night. Oh. Then they didn't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't care. You know, when, I, when I'm ahead of a, on a story and then they catch up, I'm always thrilled. I'm it, was only on one, it was only on one show, I believe, so everybody else followed you. That makes you feel better. It does. <laughs> I don't really care. I just want you to know. That's all I care about. Just know that this is all fake and made up. And you know what else was in uh, Sicario uh, Day of the Saldado? The prayer rugs in the middle of the desert. 
Apparently, this is how the movie opens. Yeah. The movie opens with uh, border agents chasing after a group of migrants on the southern border. And uh, one of them turns out to be a Muslim suicide bomber. He kneels, prays, and then detonates his bomb. And this is on the southern border. And then after that, the agents come across an abandoned prayer rug across the border. And then three suicide bombers walk into Kansas City and kill innocents. It's an epidemic we've covered from just about every side. And you think it's peaked? I mean, it couldn't get much worse. From overdoses. It's breaking my heart. To recovery. I was two minutes away from not being able to be here. From the DEA trying to control abuse. It scares the hell out of me. To a former Purdue pharmaceutical sales rep who fears she may have added to the problem. It was always in the back of my mind that maybe the company had not told us the whole truth. But now the attorney general of Massachusetts has shifted attention to something new, alleging eight members of the Sackler family caused much of the opioid epidemic huh. by controlling a deceptive sales campaign for their blockbuster drug Oxycontin. The company calls it a rush to vilify, claiming the attorney general cherry picked from among millions of documents. But none of the family members named in the lawsuit have commented. Their policy until now has been to be utterly silent, never make a comment about the opioid epidemic, and never acknowledge their connection. Christopher Glazek wrote an article on the Sacklers for Esquire magazine, mm -hmm. researching the three brothers who developed the family business, Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond. Mortimer. They were all very avid businessmen. What do you mean by that? They were all hell-bent on becoming super rich. <laughs> Arthur first got rich as a marketer, Glazek says, turning a different company's pill, Valium, yeah. into America's top-selling drug. Arthur's idea was, why don't we take this drug and give it to all kinds of patients for all kinds of ailments, patients who have headaches, who have trouble sleeping, mm. sexual problems. Arthur died years before OxyContin came to market. But Glazik says his brothers and their families applied Arthur's marketing methods to sell the drug as widely as possible. It turned them into one of the 20 richest families in the U.S., according to Forbes, with a multi-billion dollar fortune, but a very low profile. At this point, the Sackler family has homes all over the world, including on this block, one of the most exclusive in New York City. While members of the family have sat on the board of Purdue for decades, none of them have ever sat for an interview. We're stopping by in hopes of changing that. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Tony DeCoppel with uh, CBS News. Yes, sir. Um, are you uh, one of the Sackler family members? Excuse me? Security turned us away from this home, but nearby it was easy to find signs of the Sackler's influence. So we got the Sackler Center for Arts Education right here. Their name is tied to the Guggenheim, the American Museum of Natural History, and London's Victoria and Albert Museum, where the Duchess of Cambridge attended the opening of the Sackler Courtyard. There's even a Sackler wing at New York's famed Metropolitan Museum of Art. Where last year, dozens of protesters tossed pill bottles inside, calling it a temple of greed. The only Sackler willing to talk to us was Arthur's widow, Jillian, who notes Arthur died long before the opioid crisis. And unlike his brothers Mortimer and Raymond, his branch of the family never profited from it. She told CBS News Arthur would be horrified about his relative's alleged actions, adding he never would have tolerated the deception that masked how this drug was addictive. This is much bigger than the Sacklers now. This is about the Guggenheim. This is about the Met. This is about the Natural History Museum. It's about Tufts. America's elite institutions are in so deep with the Sacklers, profiting off the opioid epidemic, there's going to have to be a reckoning. Yeah, very pro-life, isn't it? It's very pro-life. The opioid addiction. And, you know, Valium was uh, the drug of the day prior to uh, the Oxy. And it's just so interesting that, uh, you know, uh, the original marketer uh, got into the Valium business. He's dead now. Uh, and, you know, Valium was one of those that was prescribed for everything. Nervous women. Oh, take a Valium, right? Nervous women and overworked men. And, uh, you know, it, it's like Viagra. It'll make you, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, uh, give you some prowess, you know, take away your inhibitions and all the Valium, Valium. And now they're in the Oxy business. And the Sackler family, which Forbes says is worth about $13 billion, 
is well known for its philanthropy around the world. And people are starting to say that the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Sackler Museum in Beijing, the Royal Academy in London, that they need to return the money and not take any more money from this house of pain that is the Sackler family. There is a case that is being brought in Massachusetts by the Massachusetts Attorney General, and she uh, has released as much as she can uh, on the case, but the court has redacted 189 paragraphs of the uh, papers, of the, the, the filings in that case. Now, because of the Russia thing, now you understand what redactions are and why they're important and how you can't really read an indictment, you can't really read a response without having these things unmasked for your edification and understanding. I will tell you what the charge is here. And I will, before I tell you what the charge is, just know this. There have been previous lawsuits against the company that the Sacklers own, Purdue Pharma, right? In 2007, the company... The individual Sacklers were not sued, just the company. And in 2007, Purdue settled for $600 million as part of a plea deal. That case involved the accusation that Purdue Pharma was misleading and defrauding physicians and consumers. They were doing what they, you know, uh, what they were telling doctors, oh, it's less, less addictive than morphine. You should prescribe this over Tylenol. I mean, it's, it's so much more effective than a Tylenol, and yet it's not addictive at all. Uh, you know, this is a much better thing to write for somebody with chronic headaches or a toothache or a sprained wrist or a, a stubbed toe, and they, the doctors started doing it. Well, 200,000 deaths later, now there's lawsuits saying that there was uh, deceptive sales and marketing practices. Now, the thing about Purdue Pharma, privately owned, privately held. There are no shareholders. It's a family company. And so they have paid out $600 million before. This particular lawsuit says, quote, they directed deceptive sales and marketing practices deep within Purdue, sending hundreds of orders to executives and line employees. From the money that Purdue collected selling opioids, they paid themselves and their family billions of dollars. The suit is heavily redacted, and it obscures a lot of details that uh, relate to this, uh, f this family, the Sackler family, and some of the executives that are also named in this suit. A lower court removed some of the redactions this month, but uh, the, the, the um, attorney general in uh, Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Healy, um, she's trying to get the 189 paragraphs that remain blacked out public. She said, revealing the truth about Purdue's misconduct is important to achieve justice and make sure deception like Purdue's never happens again. She said that in the court complaint. Uh, the complaint said that the uh, material that was concealed shows documents that contradict their testimony, meaning they lied under oath. All this is exactly what, uh, you know, the billionaire president seems to, uh, you know, do. Uh, all this is what a lot of billionaires seem to do. And they feel that they're above the law and that they can, you know, marshal all this legal help and redact certain details to protect themselves. I, did, listen, today everybody's like, yay, customs stopped a legal, you know, uh, uh, at a legal port of entry. Uh, they were able to get dogs to sniff out uh, fentanyl, synthetic, uh, you know, opioids and methamphetamines, dogs at a legal port of entry. An idiot boy president is still arguing for the stupid, stupid wall. That wouldn't have stopped that. But what about the legal drug cartels? What about them? This is, the, this is the gateway for all this addiction that we see. You know, they always told you pot was the gateway drug to heroin? Bull crap. 
I know people have been smoking. I'm the only person, and I've said this a billion times, but for newcomers, I'm the only person probably you know that does not enjoy the marijuana. I don't like it. I'm hungry and tired naturally. I don't need anything that's going to make me more hungry. It's going to make me more tired than I already am. I keep lists of everything. I can't even imagine not being like front and center in my capacity to process things and manage facts in a way that makes them simple for you if I were stoned. So I just don't do it. I just don't do it. But I have no problem with people who do it because I've known people who've, who've done it for 40, 50 years and they've never gone to heroin. But I also know some of those people who had back surgery or some of those people who had a broken bone or a sprain or a, a, you know, a, a toothache and someone gave them oxycodone and then stopped writing it for them. And the next thing you know, they're either buying pills from kids on the street in my neighborhood or they're doing bags because it's cheaper. So that was the gateway drug for this heroin epidemic. But the Sacklers, they were behind the decision to deceive doctors and patients. And now, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to expand their business. And in one of the memos, they call it end-to-end, -end, an end-to-end -end business proposal, meaning, well, we got them addicted. Now let's open treatment centers. And they were looking at these drugs that they use in treatment centers like Suboxone. They were also looking at purchasing Narcan, you know, which prevents you from ODing or brings you back from an OD, to be more specific. And they decided not to because they got a patent on some drug. We don't even know what it is. But they got their own patent on their own little drug, and they are now looking to get into the treatment business. And in one of the memos, they said it's end-to-end. -end. It's a natural progression of our business. That is unbelievable. And you know what they call people who are addicted to their own drugs? Junkies. They actually refer to them in these memos as junkies. $13 billion off of one pill. And you know what? Ever since they started writing it, deaths have tripled. Deaths have tripled. The family knew as early as 2013 that the, de the deaths from Oxycontin had tripled since they launched it in 1996. S somebody on their staff in their own company told the Sacklers that tens of thousands of deaths were only the tip of the iceberg. There are memos from concerned employees here that, you know, say we really ought to, you know, revisit this because you've got all these opioid deaths and it's the pills and, the, you know, the drug deaths. It's like 47,600 deaths in one year. Guys fired. Just move them out. Randy Rhodes, Air Force. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Happy New Year, Herky Jerky fans. We certainly hope you had a festive holiday season and wish you a very prosperous 2019. It was so nice to hear all the positive feedback from customers who purchased Turkey Jerky products during December, either as gifts or for yourself. The feedback from the holiday special of the $10 off orders over $50 and free shipping was so well received that my favorite jerky makers decided to continue it into January. So let's keep it rolling. For the rest of the month, all qualifying orders get the same discount and free shipping, no promo code necessary. All natural turkey jerky continues to be the top seller, but the four flavors of nitrite and preservative free beef jerky, close second. Many of the longest running Herky Jerky customers still prefer the meat sticks like me, and why not? The venison, elk, and buffalo sticks and the beef smokies are the best on the market. And the bacon jerky, oh yeah, it's still delicious. So keep taking advantage of the savings and Herky Jerky will continue producing the jerky you love. And thanks again for supporting our sponsor, Herky Jerky. Just visit HerkyJerky.com. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. And here's a clip from Tara Buster with Tara Devlin. So they were saying that Trump was fighting. That was it. Oh, he's fighting for his wall. First of all, wasn't it true that Mexico was supposed to pay for this effing wall? 
Why is he taking us hostage? And he's not fighting. You're not fighting. What the hell is he doing? He's, he has absolutely nothing on his schedule. He was doing nothing. He was tweeting and eating carcasses, as many carcasses as he can shove in his fat gullet mouth. He was fighting by causing Americans to not have a paycheck. That's how he fights. How much suffering he can inflict on other people. So we don't have our food inspected. What about the Coast Guard? They're not getting paid. Then you have the air traffic controllers not getting paid. Because that's how much they don't respect you as a worker. That's why the working class of this country, we need a, Trump wants a shutdown. We need a shutdown. We need a big shutdown, a real strong, hard, big, enormous, engorged shutdown. Well, you know what we really need is a damn general strike. All of the working class, we need to shut it down. For a day, sit down. That's it. Nothing moves. You want to put a fear up the spine of every oligarch, every Republican enabler, every GOP traitor, every Twitler Putin puppet moron? That's how you do it. We shut it down. That's what needs to happen immediately. Forget a month in. So they never do this to us again. This is Tara Devlin from RDTDaily.com, and that was a clip from Tara Buster. Tara Buster is recorded live every Saturday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern at the RDT Daily Facebook and YouTube channels and rebroadcast on Sunday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Progressive Voices or anytime on demand on the Progressive Voices app. Support RDT Daily and the Progressive Voices Network. Remember, we stick together, we win. Here's what's happening on the Leslie Marshall Show on the Progressive Voices Network. Brad Bannon. Brad runs Bannon Communications Research. There's no other way to look at it that Trump came. The pressure was getting too much for him. I think uh, in the last few days, despite what the president said, federal employees were complaining. Uh, FBI agents were publicly dis- uh unhappy uh, at being uh, asked to uh, perform their duties without getting paid. The Federal Aviation Agency had to close down uh, uh, JFK Airport in New York City this morning because enough air traffic controllers didn't report to work. Uh, It was just getting too much. It was destroying the nation. Tune in Monday through Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern to hear me, Leslie Marshall, on the Progressive Voices Network. And make sure to follow us both on Twitter. The handle for Progressive Voices is at progvoice, P-R-O-G-V-O-I-C-E. My handle is at Leslie Marshall. Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Tony LaGreca remembers his son Matthew's long struggle with prescription opioids, which ended his life in 2014. Almost 20 years hooked on yep. pills. Yep. And at the end, there was like no one would even speak to him but me. His son's addiction, he says, started with just a single bottle of Oxycontin. People say if he is used as directed, well, the drug abuses the patient because the drug is what takes control of their brain. A Massachusetts lawsuit is the first to name some of Purdue Pharma's owners, eight members of the Sackler family and other executives, claiming they participated in a deadly and illegal scheme. The lawsuit cites portions of newly obtained emails and memos from then-President Richard Sackler, He once said the launch of Oxycontin pills would create a blizzard of prescriptions that will bury the competition. In an email, Mr. Sackler wrote, we have to hammer on the abusers. They are the culprits and the problem. And the problem. You're the problem. You're the problem. Their their drug being uh, missold to physicians is being non-addictive and and better for you than Tylenol. Uh, No, that's not the problem. The problem is you. The problem is that your brain gets addicted after, you know, two pills, three pills. Some people, I've seen people get addicted to Oxy um, like in an hour and a half because they get a full body high from it and they go, oh my God, and they start chasing that. I'll just take another one. I'll just take another one. By the end of the week, when there's no more left, they are desperate. I've seen it. So tomorrow, this is why I bring this up today. 
tomorrow the judge in this case will give tomorrow friday will give um a, a ruling on whether or not the paragraphs in this lawsuit that are redacted can remain redacted or whether we get to see the actual redacted portions of this lawsuit which are protecting the redactions are protecting this family so uh, I will tell you, ProPublica, they reviewed uh, a lot of the redacted paragraphs in a 274-page civil complaint uh, where eight members of the Sackler family, company directors, current and former executives, are charged. And the charges are that they created the opioid epidemic through illegal deceit. That is what this case is about. And they got to see some stuff, but not all of the stuff. And so the sections that uh, were, you know, a lot of it was redacted prior and then some of it was made public. That's what ProPublica was able to look at. But the sections that were already made public, uh, they say that the Sacklers pushed for higher doses of OxyContin. They guided efforts to mislead doctors and the public about the drug's addictive capacity. And they blamed all the misuse of their drug on you calling you junkies. But here's some of the allegations. Purdue paid two executives who were convicted of fraudulently marketing Oxy. They, this, is, this is like right out of the Trump playbook. I mean, th that's why this is so good now, because now you can see what deceit uh, you know, and deception really looks like. They gave them hush money. The, the family uh, gave hush money to two executives who were convicted of fraudulently marketing Oxy uh, in order to get them to uh, be loyal to the family, to conceal the information that they uh, had about doctors who were inappropriately prescribing OxyContin uh, based on a, a marketing company's recommendation. There was a marketing company called McKinsey & Company, and they gave uh, Purdue Strategies to boost sales of OxyContin and to fix its image, including, quote, how to counter the emotional messages of mothers whose children overdosed. How to counter those messages of mothers and fathers, like that clip right there where he says, you know, his son was addicted instantly and, was, and remained addicted for 20 years and died. So this marketing company was giving advice to the, 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 the Purdue Pharmaceuticals how to counter the narrative of mothers and fathers whose children overdosed. Turns out that the Sackler family has received $4 billion in payouts since 2007, and the payments were the motivation for their misconduct. This is according to the complaint that we can read. It says, and the payments were deliberate decisions to benefit from deception in Massachusetts at great cost to patients and families. Two years after they launched Oxy, Dr. Richard Sackler, the son of, Arthur, uh, of Raymond Sackler, instructed executives in an email to sell the tablets as not merely therapeutic, but also to, quote, enhance personal performance like Viagra. Fifteen years later, he was complaining because he set up a Google alert for his company that whenever it was in the press, you know, Google will alert you that you've been mentioned. So he said that he had set up a Google, Google alert for news on OxyContin, and it was giving him too much negative information, and it was saying too many things about the dangers of Oxy. He actually wrote, why are all the alerts about negatives and not one about the positives of OxyContin tablets? He asked the company's vice president. And you know what his staff did? They replaced his Google alert with a service that would supply him with uh, sunny, happy news about Oxy. The five Purdue directors who are not Sackler family members always voted with the family, according to the complaint. It's a family-controlled company. The board co is controlled by the family. They approve everything from how many people on the sales staff staff should be hired, who should be fired, details of their bonus incentives, which are tied to volume, volume, volume. In May 2017, when Craig Landau, a longtime employee, was seeking to become the chief executive of Purdue, 
he wrote that the board acted as, quote, de facto CEO, that they were making all the decisions, and then they named him CEO. And they acknowledged that it was considering acquiring the rights to sell drugs that now combat addiction or reverse the effects of an overdose. It criticized the state for casting, Massachusetts, for casting a negative light on their exploration of a potential acquisition of an addiction treatment that was already on the market, uh, even though the company never actually made that acquisition. And of course, as I'm reading this, I wrote, I, I made notes with question marks. So you could see this is like how I work, okay? So you can see my, in pink, I always use pink uh, highlighter, right? It says Suboxone, Narcan. Well, later in this article, my question is answered. Yes, it was Suboxone and Narcan they were trying to uh, acquire. The Sackler family was once best known for its philanthropy. Its name is engraved on museums and university buildings across the world. A group of activists have called on organizations to stop accepting Sackler donations uh, and to take the Sackler name off some other institutions because... 200,000 overdose deaths are related to prescription opioids since 1999. Like I said, in 2007, they entered into a plea deal in a federal court. And they paid $600 million in fines and penalties. They pled guilty to charges of understating the risk of addiction. They blamed it on certain supervisors and certain employees. But the complaints suggest that the Sacklers were concerned about alienating two executives, then CEO Michael Friedman, then legal counsel Howard Udell. Friedman and Udell each pleaded guilty in 2007 in a U.S. district court in Abingdon, Virginia. They pleaded to a misdemeanor charge of misbranding Oxy, as did a former executive. The board signed off on the three executives' decisions to plead guilty. No member of the Sackler family pled guilty. Purdue paid $5 million to Mr. Udell in November of 2008 and up to a million in November of 2009. Then in February 2008, they paid $3 million to Mr. Friedman. They spent millions to keep the loyalty of people who knew the truth. This is just like he's, you know, Trump paying off, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 uh, Stormy Daniels and uh, Karen McDougal, the people who knew the truth. Sign an NDA, stay loyal, never say anything. And people just continue to die. At the direction of the board, Purdue repeatedly increased its sales force, which pushed doctors to prescribe higher opioid doses. That was the same year that Purdue, Purdue paid these two uh, executives. And then Richard Sackler said, it's important to select a new chief executive who's loyal to the family. Quote, people who will shift their loyalties rapidly under stress and temptation can become a liability from the owner's viewpoint, he allegedly wrote. He's a defendant now. They installed five new non-family board members after this federal investigation, but in hundreds of board votes, the new directors never once opposed the family. Never once. And when sales results were disappointing, Sackler family members didn't hesitate to intervene. In 2010, Purdue told the family that sales of the highest dose and most profitable opioids were lower than expected. This is according to the complaint that we can read. And that meant an expected quarter end payout to the family of only $260 million. The family was expecting a payout of $320 million, and they were only going to get $260 million. And the $260 million would have to be paid in two installments, like $130 and then $130 million. Mortimer wrote, why are you both reducing the amount of the distribution and delaying it and splitting it in two? Just a few weeks ago, you agreed to distribute the full 320 in November. Can you imagine this? 
From 2009 until 2014, this uh, PR group, McKinsey, helped Purdue shape its message for selling OxyContin and overcoming concerns about addiction and overdoses. According to the redacted passage, uh, passages, the consultant told Purdue in a PowerPoint slide presentation that it could increase prescription writing by convincing doctors that opioids represent freedom. Seriously, it's in quotes. Freedom and peace of mind, in quotes, and give patients, quote, the best possible chance to live a full and active life. McKinsey would study the pushback from patients and encourage hesitant doctors to prescribe opioids. In a meeting with Purdue executives, McKinsey planned how to, quote, counter the emotional messages from mothers with teenagers that overdosed on OxyContin by recruiting pain patients to talk about their need for these drugs. In a 2013 report, McKinsey recommended directing the sales representatives to focus on the most prolific opioid prescribers, the people who wrote the most prescriptions, because that group writes, quote, 25 times as many oxy scripts. And they also noticed that OxyContin prescription writing rose in tandem with the visits to uh, the sales reps would make to doctors. So McKinsey recommended increasing each salesperson's quota from 1,400 visits a year to 1,700 doctor's visits a year because this PR firm estimated that targeting the most frequent prescribers could boost OxyContin sales by hundreds of millions of dollars. So they raised the quotas on the sales reps, and as the sales reps' quotas increased, so did their total visits to doctors. And their defense at Purdue is, oh, we weren't selling Oxy, we were selling a laxative. I don't know. They also recommended, McKinsey did, that Purdue fight back against efforts by major pharmacy chains, the DEA, and the DOJ. McKinsey should fight back against a massive pharmacy chain, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and the Department of Justice to stop illegal opioid prescribing. These chains were asking for help from that, and they said, uh, these new rules are cutting into sales of the highest doses, which are the most profitable. Then they entered into this new project, and it was called Project Tango. And I could just imagine them sitting in the conference room talking to each other, going, it takes two to tango. Yeah, it takes two to tango. So we get them addicted, and then they need us to get them unaddicted. So Project Tango was a secret project to join the treatment center industry, addiction treatment. It was codenamed Project Tango. It involved Purdue executives and staff as well as Kathy Sackler, the daughter of the co-founder Mortimer Sackler, and a defendant in the Massachusetts lawsuit. She participated in phone calls and told staff that the project required immediate attention. In internal uh, mail emails to each other, they were saying, this is a growing industry, it's, and we need aggressive marketing, and we, and we have to get into the, you know, and it's end-to-end -end, uh, care. We get them addicted, now we get them clean, right? Quote, it is an attractive market, the team working on the project wrote in a presentation. Quote, large unmet need for vulnerable, underserved, and stigmatized patient population suffering from substance abuse, dependence, and addiction. Oxycontin sales were declining, and so they decided the addiction treatment market was expanding, and they were going to get into that new business and the documents actually recommend becoming quote an end-to-end -end pain provider and this is the paragraph where my question was answered purdue intended to sell one such medication suboxone which is cu currently re uh, retailed 
as a film that melts in the, your mouth. And when Kathy Sackler asked staff members to look into reports that children might be swallowing the film, they reassured her. They responded, according to the complaint, that youngsters were overdosing on pills, but not the film. That is a positive for Project Tango. And then they turned its attention to another potential product, the overdose reversing agent known as Narcan, and they called it a strategic fit. Because you can OD on the Oxy and Narcan can save you. Strategic fit. Go to randyroads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.